Hello, everyone. Um, it's so amazing to be here in person. Thank you so much for showing up in person and all of you online. Um, I appreciate your time today, and I hope you are energized after my presentation. Thank you. So we are here to talk about uh, dynamic data binding and theming. And I'm guessing that all of you probably know th what that is, but I am going to start with a brief introduction. Um, a little background on me. Um, well, first of all, um, I was blown away by the presentations of all the folks on my team. I, I lead the MRTK team. That's the most passionate folks I've ever worked with. They actually, their presentation was so good. I'm like, man, I need to up my games. I worked last night and today to make mine a little less geeky and a little more polished. And, and I just said, forget it. You guys are geeky. I'm geeky. We can handle being geeky together. <laughs> so um, it's going to be kind of geeky. Um, so just a little bit about me. I um, was on the Holland's team right around launch. Um, I worked on the NASA project, the onsite, and worked on the Trimble partnership, the audited, two different Autodesk partnerships. So I had some early insights into what's happening in this emerging industry. And I ran off and started a, a, one of the very first agencies to build apps for large companies like British Petroleum, Stryker, Zimmer Biomet, you name it. And so I got a lot of background on, um, thank you for the clicker. Um, I got a lot of background on um, how, to, how to build for enterprise. And so, you know, the market um, wasn't really um, favorable to a company that wanted to stay 100% focused on mixed reality and specifically HoloLens, especially when we weren't really interested in venture capital. So we, um, so I decided to come back to the mothership. So here I am, leading the MRTK team and bringing all that enterprise focus to what we're building. Um, everybody else was doing something about their personal life. I don't geek out that much except with my um, son, Kai. You know, we build robots. I made time of flight sensors available within Scratch so you could do Scratch programming. But I do woodworking, and I'm just learning how to weld. I summit mountains, I rock climb. That's kind of what I do when I'm not here doing all this cool stuff. Um, Yoon, unfortunately, oh, I probably need to plug this in. I'm just going to do this. I think I can handle that. <laughs> so Yoon is our absolutely amazing principal UX designer. He makes everything you see look as amazing as it does. He's backed by an incredible, incredible team of designers. You know, UX, everything, artists, modelers. And um, through all of that effort, we always are thinking about what the design needs are as well as the programming needs. Sadly, he's in Korea, South Korea. He was not able to be here. But he did record his half so that you can still uh, benefit from it. So I'm going to cover data binding, and he's covering theming. I'm going to introduce theming a little bit before his, um, just for some bridge context. So what is data binding? Data binding is pretty simple. It's like you've got UX and you want to present things. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of kind of the early you know, pr proving out what's possible. You just statically design everything in Unity, and it's just all static. And then you, you, know, you write some custom code to populate text mesh pros with text coming from somewhere else. Well, having been out there building for enterprise, I just absolutely knew that we could add a lot of value by just solving some of those problems for you in the context of Unity, of course, and mixed reality. And so it's really just connecting the UX to where the data comes from. And we're, we, our commitment is to do it in a way that it can meet a wide variety of needs. And the most important thing is that if the data updates, the UX updates automatically. You don't have to do anything. It just happens. So we had a lot of ambitious goals for this. Um, one um, that I've charged or uh, challenged the whole team to do is just like, how do you make absolutely everything enterprise ready? How do you think about everything's possible at runtime that's possible at design time? How do you make sure that everything is, can kind of predict the future and offer ways to make it possible to use it even if we had not implemented yet? And you know, what, a lot of the feedback we were hearing was that you had to um, modify MRTK code to meet your needs. and then getting an MRTK update would actually be challenging because now you've got custom versions of MRTK. And we're trying to get away from that model and have it all be highly extensible through dependency injection and you know, derive classes and in other ways that don't require you to ever, ever, ever touch our code. Another is you know, data sources come from everywhere. They come from custom backends, from standard backends, from RESTful services, 
from C sharp state objects that just give you the state of your application that you may want to present to the UX. And so we wanted to make sure that was totally open ended. And then one of our tenets is make the common use cases super easy, but make absolutely certain you can handle even the most sophisticated use cases as well, because we can never predict what everybody might want to try to do with the technology that we deliver. Um, the other thing is we want to make sure that we weren't just like, you're going to start with MRTK and everything's going to be great. Uh, we want to make sure that no matter what you already had in play, if you want to use our data binding, you can add it at any time, no matter in your product life cycle, and it'll just work. It won't require you to rethink how you've done your entire application, which is important uh, for an emerging industry that is starting to mature because there's a lot of stuff out there already. Um, the other is that, you know, in traditional data binding, usually think of images and text. In 3D, it's so much more than that. It's audio clips, animation clips, materials. It's like, you name it. It's so much more that you want to data bind. You don't just want to data bind text and images. It's a lot more than that. Um, extensible, I talked about that already. And then the other is like, we heard loud and clear that MRTK, pretty much everything, takes too much frame time. Like, please, 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 don't use any more um, frame time. Don't use any more RAM than you need. Don't cause garbage collection. So we have this commitment to um, making sure our footprint is light. Um, another is like, data binding without collections isn't really data binding because collections are the kind of the bread and butter of showing data. So we have a really comprehensive collection system that makes it possible to handle the largest collections you can throw out of millions of items, and it all just works. Um, themable. So this was actually, I, I, I have to say that that was not one of the original um, objectives, but we folded that in when we realized the plumbing for theming is very similar to the plumbing for data binding. And like, why don't we leverage all this plumbing to also expose theming? And I'll go into some of the challenges that that presented, because there are a couple. Um, data preparation pipeline, this is the one thing I'm talking about briefly here that we don't have yet. It's the idea that, OK, you get data from a database, but you don't necessarily want to show a number from 0 to 1. You might want to normalize that to 20 to 30 or whatever. Or you may want to localize to a different language. And that pipeline is, is on a roadmap. We don't have it yet today, but that is scheduled for GA. And the uh, minimal dependencies tied into what I said earlier about being able to tie it into any existing app. Um, it's the dependencies are so minimal. You can use data binding with v2. I mean, it just it doesn't have any dependencies. Um, I mean, we ostensibly say that we only support 2020 and forward of Unity, but the reality is, it's it is being used in earlier versions. We just are not committing to keeping that uh, fully tested on our journey. We want to focus more in the future, but um, let it be said that it actually works all the way back to 2018 currently. We, that may change, but currently it does. So just to give you an idea of how real this is, this is shipping in guides right now, as of, I think, last September. Like, everything you see in here is data bound. All the items in the list, even the buttons. Um, when you type in the text, it's updating the list, which then propagates and updates the, the contents of the, the presented list. Those lists can be quite large, and it's only fetching the very thing that you're looking at. Um, we also have something called prefetching, where it's going to prefetch the ones that it predicts you might scroll to, so that they're already prefetched and populated. So it, it's in production quality. That said, we have really high standards. We know from actually having made it into production, we've learned so much about all the things that we did, haven't done well enough and wanted to improve. And Perf is one of them. We did a lot of Perf for this. Um, but there are a lot of things that we still want to do. So we're calling this like early preview just to set the right expectation. We want to make sure that if you start playing around with it, give us feedback. That's what we want. We want all your feedback. Say, you know, this could be better. Um, one of the big things is I want to refactor out all the collection related stuff that is currently embedded in like the data source. Only some things are collections. Not everything's a collection. Why should that uh, be in the interface? Um, so just to give you a rundown of some of the key features. I mean, I probably should have done my little vocabulary before this because no, I think these words will all make sense. Um, so data sources on the side of where the data is coming from. Out of the box, we support any C sharp object, which includes scriptable objects. Um, we support JSON. We just support dictionary. Dictionary is great for just like put a bunch of key value pairs for testing or use it for runtime state. Like just put stuff in a key dictionary, and every time you change any of those values, 
that will update whatever is listening to those values. And it just makes it super easy to just prototype things or even at run in production code to create stand up just to runtime state and make that drive your interface. And the dictionary is string only, so that is a limit. Um, all the others can support any data type, in directly or indirectly. Like JSON can say, here's, here's the information it takes to drive the path that will get it from a resource or from a streaming asset. Or even, here, here's, here's the JSON that is the URL that causes you to fetch the image that then gets put onto a quad. All that plumbing is actually in there already. So any consumer. So we already support quite a few, but the idea is that it's super, super easy to add more. And I'll show you that actually in a little while. But we support collections, which I talked about text, obviously, textile sheets for both styling your app and white labeling it, and also for accessibility. Um, materials, sprites, um, audio clips. We don't have animations yet, but I'll show you how easy that can be. Um, and then events and custom. Um, like the, the D365 team needed a Boolean event generator. So they just wrote one to solve that need. And it's now part of the package. Um, so part of the um, making the simple cases easy and making the more complex cases possible is auto discovery and the auto configuration. So the idea here, um, one of the clever mechanisms that we support is as long as your source is higher in the hierarchy than any of a hundreds potentially of things that want to actually get data from that one data source, every one of those data consumers will can auto discover just by walking up each parent until it finds one. And obviously there's a slight um, one-time initialization penalty for doing that, but it makes it super easy. I'm gonna show you, like you literally drop in a data source and data consumer and it just works. Like that's it, like literally no, no change can configure anything. Um, virtualized collections, I talked about that. We have object pooling, um, so we'll reuse objects. They will be prefetched in case you have latency challenges with talking to a backend database. And then we have this thing called an item placer, which is the glue to something that knows how to put it into your interface. So one of the things that we uh, abandoned was a, a much more complex and convoluted way of building a list that we thought was going to be this brand thing that just isn't materializing as the right solution, especially when we decided we're just going to adopt Canvas completely wholesale. And so what we haven't written yet, and we will in the next weeks um, probably, is the data binding to make it possible to data bind a Canvas list. Just right out of the box, just a, can a canvas list, you drop it into your app and it, will, it can be data bound uh, right out of the box. And if you, you know, swipe it or scroll it or whatever, it, it just works. Um, namespace resolution. So this is kind of interesting. If you're gonna have a data source that has its own data namespaces that you have no control over, like first underscore name, last underscore name, but you wanna create prefabs that are kind of generalized, like a contact list prefab, then maybe you decide to do F name and L name Something has to map those two. So there's this thing called a key path mapper that will say, if the name in the prefab is one thing, automatically map it to what's coming in from the data source. And I already talked about the data manipulator. Um, we've got a strong, I should have put accessibility in here potentially, but localization, formatting, make it look like currency or date, um, which of course ties into localization. Normalization, the thing I was talking about, about change, like putting ellipsis on text or changing the range of a value, and then you can create your own in this pipeline, and there can be as many as you want between the data source and any data consumer. I'm probably not gonna go too much into this, but this is kind of introducing the vocabulary. One of the cool things that we're doing, which has its pros and its cons, is that we modeled our selector between the data consumer and the data source to be exactly like you would access a JSON element from JavaScript, so it does limit us to atomic values, lists, and dictionaries, but it does make it super, super easy to stand up um, both ends of the equation and to have it still be human readable. Um, one of the challenges that this has presented is for collections because without using something like a GUID for the actual specifier for the collection, like you wouldn't necessarily want you know, my list within my data set square bracket, 10 square bracket because if you delete number nine, 10 isn't 10 anymore, now it's nine. And those are the challenges that we're facing. We're, that's one of the things that we're still gonna fix by at least making list skewers as opposed to these keypads, um, just to give you some background. Um, most of these are things that you probably understand um, inherently. Data controller is interesting. Uh, that's probably one that's worth talking about. Uh, data controller is this need to say, like, I've got a giant list of items. I wanna select one. 
where does the ID come from for selecting it? Um, so what data, um, con data controller does is say, I am going to send out an event, and I'm going to set it to the ID of that particular item so that the recipient of the event now does know how to get back to the data that was represented by that one prefab and a giant list of prefabs. And that's kind of a really important, cool feature. Um, this is another one I'm not going to go into too, too much detail, but this kind of pulls together all of the different components that I just talked about and how they all interrelate to each other. Um, there's one other minor little thing that I didn't talk about, which is the data source provider, which is, remember I was telling you about the auto configuration and auto discovery? Well, sometimes you don't want that. You want your data source to be just a C-sharp object, not a game object, or, I mean a mono behavior. And you don't want it to be in your hierarchy. You can create a, there's a very lightweight thing called a data source provider, which this is a way to tell any data consumer where to find the actual data source that you want it to use. And there can be as many different data sources in play at the same time. Like it can be, you could have hundreds and it'll all just still work. So now I'm going to do an actual um, demo. Um, this, the demo setup is that it's a RESTful joke API. And um, it was a kind of a pretty cool moment when all this plumbing first existed. And I'm like, what are some of the things I can do to test and prove that all works? And so I just found things like a joke API, a photo API, and just started standing them up. And it just worked. And it was kind of magical. And I just wanted to share that magic with you because I was, I was feeling at that moment like, like we, do, we were on to something, that, that this was a lot easier to use than other, other data binding solutions that are out there on the market. Um, and it's worth mentioning that the guys team had an, another open source data binding um, uh, framework, but it just wasn't meeting their needs and it was incredibly complex and it was really hard to configure and it was really fragile. It was really easy for things to break when things changed. And so um, they adopted ours and they've been thrilled to the point where we have a super, super deep uh, partnership with them and they're actually contributing back to the MRTK because of the strength of our partnership. Um, so this RESTful API is super simple. Um, you set up what kind of joke you want, and you do this RESTful call, and you get back something that looks like this. And the cool thing about it is because of what I described about how JSON accessors are the key paths, the magic selectors between the data consumer and data um, source side, it's as easy as saying uh, that you want to get the delivery, you want to get the setup, or you want to get the flags dot religious and see whether that's true or false. So this is a self-running demo. I've done it so many times I could have done it live, but I decided that I would just do this. There we go. Um, so um, I'm basically starting 100% from scratch. If you went to some of the um, intro um, st starting your first project, this is exactly what you saw. Um, it's put it, the XR rig in there, optionally put in the input simulator so you can use all the navigation if you want. Um, I mean, that's just ba basic, very simple plug plumbing steps. And what I'm going to do then is build up a very, very simple um, hierarchy of, of nodes in the scene, um, just an app root. An app root, for a simple case at least, is a good place to maybe put your data source. Um, obviously, you want to. Um, instantiate data sources at runtime in a more complex scenario, and that obviously is all possible. Um, but this allows you to stand up scenarios very, very fast. UX route, mainly for making sure things are showing at the right place. So I'm going to put one of our MRTK slates in there just as a nice backplate for the joke and the punchline. Um, and in that slate, you just have to set all the scale, as we learned earlier. If you set it to millimeters, it makes your life easier. OK, here's the magic. Um, this is the text mesh pro. That's going to deliver the, the setup of the joke in the punchline. And this one is one of the coolest ones in that the only thing you have to do to bind a text mesh pro to, that, to a data source is to use these curly brace markers in the text that you put in there. If you're doing localization, the curly, brace, the curly braces would be um, in the deliver text from your localization system.
Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I jumped back from the Text Mesh Pro to setting up the canvas. So I was hoping that not too much of the demo would be able to set up, but there, there is a little bit of stuff. But I wanted to see, like, this is really legitimately from nothing. Like, I did not, there's no magic, zero magic. This is 100% from absolutely nothing. Um, oh, there we go. So there's, there's how you deliver the setup and delivery. I don't know if you remember in the JSON, that, those were the actual names of the keys for, the, for root level elements. And that's how this finds them, is by the fact that those are at the root level. Um, I also um, just, just tried the example to prove to myself that it all worked right before this, that you could do the flags dot in religion or religious or political. And sure enough, everything worked exactly as I would have expected. Um, so now I'm just changing the URL, which I need to remove as a default, and putting in the one that you saw in that, um, that original slide. It's that exact same URL. And now I need to put in the data source. Well, the data, so we have this thing called JSON test, data source JSON test. It's kind of hard to generalize a data source. We have a data source base class that you, I'm sorry, data source JSON base class that you drive from. But it's hard to predict what you actually want to do to get when you want to get the JSON and, and how to use it. But this one is just a test script that's provided in the examples that just any, every five seconds it'll refetch the data. Just a really easy way to try things out. And there it is. That's getting live data from that um, v2.jokes.dev, or jokesapi.dev. I mean, it's really is that simple. I mean, data consumer, data source, they find each other, put these curly braces in. And honestly, using material, doing this for materials, doing this for anything is just that easy as well. So. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to do a little introduction of theming before Yoon takes it over virtually. Or is it still called virtual when you just pre-recorded? Um, so theming. So remember I was saying that theming was kind of a derivation of data binding. It uses all the same plumbing. And it turns out that that actually proved to be true, except for one critical uh, difference. Um, well, first of all, what is theming? Well, theming is to customize the visualization of an app for completely changing the style. Now, we take theming kind of a step further, where theming could be just for one little thing. It doesn't have to be the whole app. But we do support theming across the whole app, and we're going to show that. But um, the idea is that you might want to offer your own clients to be able to you know, white label your app and change the complete theming to whatever they, they want it to look like. You might be offering a service, and you want every one of your clients to see the app look like their own branding. And the, the other use is you don't like the MRTK out of the box theming because it doesn't represent your company. So um, right now, it's really good for you to use to get everything set up. The one thing we don't have yet is the big mad the big magic button that says, OK, I don't want you to do it runtime anymore. I want you to freeze it and make it the um, design time defaults. And then it never has to do theming ever again. That one magic button that you press doesn't exist yet. But it's on our roadmap to make it possible to freeze it for, um, for the rest of the app's life. And of course, you can do it over and over again if you want. Um, so here's some examples, just to give you an idea of how comprehensive it is. Notice the rounded corners are changing. Notice the colors are changing. The fonts, I believe, if they aren't changing, they're supposed to be changing. Um, oh, that's right. There's another demo where the, the fonts themselves change. But the idea is that um, every UX we provide has the necessary plumbing to make this work out of the box. Um, the cool thing is, if you don't want theming, zero, 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 zero footprint, zero CPU, zero anything. Um, so we made sure that. If you don't want theming, it's on your way. If you want theming, it works as you would expect, and maybe even better. This is a cool example. Um, we need to refactor this. We've already gotten feedback that it kind of mixes view and model, and theming is mixed with data model. And I looked at it, I was like, oh, you're right. You're totally right. So, um, But all the concepts work. Um, the idea here is that um, this was actually trying to exercise a really complex case where the number of sprites for the battery were a different number than for charging than it is for not charging. Um, the battery to sprite mapping was nonlinear. Um, so we were trying to handle a really hard, realistic use case and prove that it was all at least possible. And within a couple hours, we had been able to create this to show that it's all possible with 
all the data binding plumbing coming from two values coming from an OS or a virtual OS, which is the current charging level and whether it's charging or not. And then everything else just works. OK, so this is the, so this is the plumbing that makes all this possible. It involves, and the plumbing, the, the hard part about theming is when you want to both theme and data bind something, because you effectively are doing two bindings at the same time. And we wanted to make that easy as well, which was one of the harder use cases, because a good example is, let's just say you have an app where you have an icon set for status. Every status, you know, completed, waiting, whatever, is a different icon. But then your client wants those icons to be the icons that look the way they do, and your other client wants it to look the way they want it. Well, you want the data value from a database to which icon to use to be data bound, but then you also want it to be data bound in such a way that it's even at runtime, it's easy to swap out what the look and feel is. What if you have a dark theme and a light theme and you need different artwork or different text or whatever? Um, all of that plumbing will support this combination of both the data being data bound and then also being themed. And this is the plumbing that makes that possible in addition to the other hard use case, which is we wanted to make sure our UX package was absolutely 100% independent of our data binding package. And we pulled that off by having one single very lightweight script in the UX side of the world that says, I'm going to call some arbitrary data binding configurator. I have no clue what it's going to do, but it's going to do all the work for me. And that's all. That's all. Like it, so there's one really lightweight script on the UX side. That one is symboled out. So one, if when you're trying out these examples, remember, read the documentation, set the one symbol that is absolutely required to make this work because of that complete zeroing out of it, which is, you know, you can look it up, but it's MRTK, UX, data binding, and theming is the symbol. And if you turn that on, that connection works. So that um, really lightweight script is told about a profile, which in this case is a scriptable object. That profile has all of the bindings in it for, like, if, and we're, we're using something that is controversial on our end, and we would love your feedback. Um, there, there are going to be mul there are multiple ways of doing this binding. Every single thing in your prefab could have the data consumers explicitly put on there, and everything will work. But what we do is we say, if the game object has a certain name, we will then bind it to this key path, and that key path will then be the thing that fetches the material, or fetches the sprite, or fetches the font icon, or whatever it is that you're trying to bind. So there's two values. One is what's the game object name, or regex, or partial name, and what's the key path that maps to. And that's all that has to be in the data mining, and everything else works. And what happens is that config file that gets passed to the data mining side if it's turned on, and it does all the heavy lifting of at runtime putting all the data consumers on your objects and, and all the attaching to between consumers and uh, sources just is all part of the attach process and it all just happens for you. So to make all that magic possible that combines both theming and data binding, we have this fairly magical base class called um, Data Consumer Themable Base. And I just wanted to show you how easy it can be to create one for your own components, your own whatever. I mean, it could be anything, honestly. Um, but there's a whole logic to automatically identify components that are the right components for the type of theming you want to do. Like if you wanted to add animation clip, that could just be yeah, animation clip. And um, so you tell it which, which components that you want it to be themed. And then when a set object gets called, potentially for multiple components, hundreds potentially, if you got a really massive prefab or whatever, and it will just automatically um, do all the work of giving that to this set object for everyone that it found whenever the data changes or the first time it's encountered. And all you have to do is set the right value in your, in your code. As simple as that. And several of them, if you look through all the code that we provide, all this is available today on GitHub, um, you'll see that several of them are this simple. Some of them are harder because we're doing harder stuff. Like on text, the text mesh pro one in particular is a little bit more complicated because uh, if you have multiple of these curly braces in the same um, text mesh pro, if you, if you update them one at a time, as those modification notifications come through, it's really hard to manage unless you do them all at once. So there's a, it adds to this concept of um, atomic sets, and so you start an atomic set, you get all your data, and then you end the atomic set, you know, data uh, change begin and end, 
and um, it'll then do it at the end when all of the data has been accumulated. Why all is right, the theming so is useful? Is... The theming could be a powerful tool when you want to use a single app or mixed reality solution. I messed it up because I just wanted to introduce you. So this is Juno, our UX, principal UX designer who can't, couldn't be here. He's taking the rest of this, but I think we will have a small amount of time for Q&A, so I will just exit and come back as soon as he is done. I need to learn how to drive PowerPoint clearly. Why the theming is useful? The theming could be a powerful tool when you want to use a single app or mixed reality solution for multiple customers, clients, and brands. So you don't need to manually replace materials and properties one by one if you use MRTK theming. So here's an example of an imaginary app that has multiple UI elements built with MRTK 3s UI building blocks. So this is the default mixed reality design language. And Using MRTK3 theming, the visual can be customized something like this. Um, so this is a company A with an orange-based color theme. Um, so as you can see, all UI elements has been customized for this branding color scheme. Then there's a company B, which has a red color as their key branding element. Um, then there could be a company C with a black and white style logos and branding. Um, and as you can see, a single application or solution can have a visual look and feel customized for a specific brand while maintaining the same functionalities. Let's take a look at how to use a theming. To use a theming, you need a something called a theme profile. And it is recommended to duplicate existing one uh, since it's easier to replace existing elements. And also, you can create a new theme profile using MRTK's menu. The theme profile looks like this. Uh, it contains a list of all themable elements, such as textile, material, and sprite, etc. And as you can see, you can customize every details of the UI components in MRTK3, from the back plates to front plates to toggle visuals, And the list of these elements are defined in a file called binding profile. And there's a script called UX binding configurator, which automatically finds these elements in a child and make them themable. So this script needs to be assigned to the parent level of the object or prefab. And for all MRTK provided UI prefabs, uh, this UX binding configurator script is assigned to the top level of the prefabs. And if you want to customize the font as well, you need to create a new text style sheet. And again, it is recommended to duplicate the existing one and modify it. And it'll be easier than create a new style sheet. Um, so from there, you can customize the font, color, size, etc. for a specific style name, such as body, header, or h1 or h2. Uh, so quite similar to CSS. And for the font name, you can just put the name of the text mesh pros as the font asset name. Then back to the theme profile, you just need to assign your newly created text style sheet. And finally, the target text mesh pro object need to be assigned with the proper text style. Uh, one important thing here is that the, by default, the text style is set as a normal However, this normal style is not overridable. Uh, it is resolved by Text Mesh Pro. So you need to assign uh, the text style other than this normal style. You can do the similar thing for the sprite as well. MRTK3's default UX theme profile has one example of a sprite, which is used for the shadow in a toggle switch button. Now we know that we can make the material and text themable with MRTK3. 
Then we started exploring the idea of achieving some of the accessibility capabilities with this theming, such as text size scaling and high contrast mode. Uh, this is an example of text scaling in Windows 11. Uh, as you can see, all type hierarchy needs to be scaled up proportionally. Sometimes text can be truncated or wrapped depending on the app's UI design decision. Um, and we can use Text Mesh Pro's style sheet to define proper type ramp uh, that can be used across the app experience. So for example, here's a type ramp for our UI. Uh, one on the left, we have a semantic name of a specific style. And on the right, we have a text size and weight for specific elements in the UI. And we can define this as a text mesh pros style sheet. By doing this, we can secure a good hierarchy of the text and good readability. Also, it can bring the consistency throughout the app experience since it can prevent one off type size in the UI level. And again, all you need to do is assigning proper text style in the UI elements. Uh, this is an example of assigning main header and sub text style in the, our button UI. Then you can imagine we can define multiple text style sheet with different type sizes, regular, medium, and large text. Then with MRTK3's theming, we can easily switch text style sheet on the runtime. So here's an example uh, demo. As you can see, with MRTK theming, text style sheet can be dynamically switched and we can achieve this kind of runtime text scaling. Uh, this could be part of the settings menu in your app so that users can adjust overall text size based on their personal preferences. High contrast mode is another crucial feature for accessibility. Uh, since it is simply about providing color schemes for good contrast, uh, there is nothing really different from the theming, regular theming. So using the theming, uh, we can configure backplate and text color combination that secures good high contrast. Um, so here's an example of a regular versus high contrast theme. And here's an example of a regular default theme. It can be switched to high contrast dark theme and the light theme with the dark text on the bright backplate. Um, so this kind of a light theme with a large bright surface is uh, generally not recommended for HoloLens additive display since it can cause eye fatigue. Uh, this is just an example of possibility for achieving high contrast mode using MRTK3's theming system. Here is a quick runtime demo switching materials together with text scaling for high contrast. So, so yeah, switching the material between the regular versus high contrast and yeah, text scaling together. So there is a quick intro to MRTK3's theming feature. Um, can't wait to see what you can build with it. Thank you. So here's the amazing thing. Um, there's already at least three, if not more, inc inc incidences of people just running with this, and it just came together, and I didn't even know sometimes they were doing it. Um, guides, just we didn't have any documentation yet, and they just ran with it and started integrating. And before I knew it, they were starting to you know tell me, hey, can you do this, Hoff? Can you do that, Hoff? And, uh, and you know, so we did do a lot of work to make it perform well to meet some of their uh, more esoteric needs. And, and that, all of that obviously helps make it production quality by figuring all those things out in conjunction with an actual production application. Um, similarly, Yoon just, like literally, he just thought, oh, this is really cool. And he, like, he just would start posting examples. Like, <laughs> like, I didn't even know he was doing it. He didn't need any help at all. He figured it out. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do is make it easy to embrace and easy to use while also making the things possible that I may not have predicted when we first designed this. And so, you know, I think that 
we have accomplished a lot of that, but like I said, we have high standards and we really want to continue to clean it up a little more. And um, so yeah, so it's a good beginning and I hope that this is exciting for you and I can't wait to see what y'all build with it. So, and I think we have, a, yeah, we have, we have 10 minutes for Q&A, so hopefully you have some good questions. Yeah, so I can repeat the question. So uh, the question is, is this compatible with MRTK2? Um, so the answer is yes. In fact, it's compatible with any app you have, no matter whether you've ever touched MRTK or not. Um, the only dependency is a very, very small package we call Core, which we've intentionally made super, super small. Um, it's mainly just interfaces that we want to expose between packages so that this, it's the, the binding profile stuff that I mentioned that makes it possible to bind between UX and data binding is in that core. And so if you have to pull in core, super lightweight, I think it's scripts only, so it's not even like it's gonna get, you know, bloat anything, bloat your streaming assets or your resources. Any other question? Oh, oh. So the question is, what happens when you have uh, really long wait times for downloading information, like from a database, and then uh, you know you're you're basically waiting for that data before you can proceed? Um, so, for I mean, the the one specific case where we absolutely are handling that is in the uh, collection uh, predictive prefetch. Um, it, the idea, and and you can actually trigger the prefetch without it happening happening automatically. But the idea is that it'll grab an object from the data pool or multiple objects, and it will start that process while you're looking at this one set of photos or contexts or whatever. And in the background, it's you know just doing its work of populating the next set of prefabs. And the second you scroll, it, it releases the ones that you're currently looking at to the data pool for future reuse, and then the new ones are 100% ready to populate. And that was actually one of the really important features we added for the real life use cases like uh, Guides365 because they do talk to a real backend database and even a few milliseconds is annoying, especially when you want to load up 30 new prefabs and have them all ready to go. And so the predictive prefetch dramatically improved the performance of, of all of that around tripping to some high latency backend. F so beyond that, there are other, you know, we all live in, in, live through some of the challenges like yeah, downloading an image and getting it onto a texture has some challenges, and yeah, we're constantly trying to figure out ways of reducing the impact of some of those you know, high latency and, and uh, compute consuming uh, features. But the data binding package doesn't solve those, at least not yet. Um, if there are other scenarios that you would like to solve, let me know. I mean, we're constantly trying to figure out like what's holding you back? What's making it hard for you to you know, achieve fast time to value? What, what makes it hard for you to prototype your next application or your next feature? Any other questions? Ah. That, that's an excellent point. Um, so the, the thing that we've done is, so we have interfaces that are designed to be super lightweight and easy to implement, but a lot of stuff is happening behind the scenes. So what we've done is we've created as much of the code as we can into a completely Unity agnostic base class that has a lot of the logic that has nothing to do with Unity. And then we have a Geo game object base class on top of that. And that does as much of the heavy lifting as possible so that when you derive a new class on top of that base class, the amount of code that you have to put in there, or well, not the amount, but the code you have to put in there is all the stuff that we can never predict, like the things that are to a custom database, or you know, obviously there are going to be patterns of things that will eventually say, oh, well, that's done all the time, so let's make sure we support that, which would be, I mean, good examples. We we currently support JSON payloads, but we 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 haven't written an XML 
payload, uh, and, and it obviously makes sense to write an XML payload handler. Um, so, so that you can be sure is going to be added. Um, but the reality is, you know, fetching fetching a RESTful service is generic and not really MR focused, and we're trying to. Uh, stay as focused as close as possible to what truly is unique about mixed reality and truly unique about deploying real production solutions inside a, uh, inside a you know, mixed reality type application. And that, that starts getting closer and closer to things that you can find elsewhere in other open source projects. And we're tending to not prioritize those just because there are other, it's all you know, fairly mature uh, challenges that, that there's plenty of good software out there to solve. Yes, yeah, so, so the question is, I'm showing theming that feels a little bit more like static theming. You've got your five themes set up, or you know, dark, light, and company A, company B. What if all of your theming data is really coming from like an online data source? Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, that is absolutely what this is designed to do. And this goes back to theming really is just another type of data and data source, right? Like theming can literally be anywhere, all the data. Like you can literally, you know, to the extent that it's possible, download an asset bundle with all the theming assets, and you know, load it in, and then you can even have a theming profile for that, and then that theming profile you insert at runtime, and, and, it, and it all should work. One of the big things that we had to make sure absolutely works is on any of these prefabs that are themed, like you can literally say, disable, enable, disable, enable, and it'll populate, unpopulate. <laughs> like it's, it's pretty magical to be able to do all this at runtime, uh, where the attach-detach process makes it super easy to say, OK, I'm going to attach a new data source. And that data source happens to have theming from a content management system. And all that data now is available. And the second I attach, everything gets that initial, all your data's changed. I need to tell you about it. And that will populate all your interface. And you can even go so far as fetch a new one and have it change to that new one. So if you have a whole bunch of themes that some, like even uh, you know, community-based uh, ecosystem of theming, you can even make it possible for that to be true, where you actually have um, community um, assets that now are th uh, loadable to be the theme. And, and theming, honestly, could be, you know, uh, well, this isn't necessarily an entertainment-focused audience, but you know, the, the, all the content for a level or something. I mean, the data, all the plumbing is meant to just connect data to how it's presented. And from that generic sense, it, it's, it's capable of doing all these things and having that data live in the cloud. A question back there? I, I think I'm being asked to change. Oh, no, he's, so we are now giving mics to our questioners, question okay. askers. Um, so do your data bindings um, fall back in hierarchical precedence such that if you had one text mess pro with, you know, curly bracket, curly bracket, some local data, and then on the next line, curly bracket, curly bracket, some global data um, entity, could you actually get that correctly? That, that is a really good question. This speaks to make the simple easy and the complex or the advanced uh, possible. Um, every single data source can be given a simple text name, like this is my uh, runtime data. This one's called uh, backend data. And all you need to do is on those text mesh pros, tell it which data source you actually want to get it from. And another way is put a data provider closer to it so that it points to the right one. And that data provider is effectively can even leapfrog one that's at a higher part of the game hierarchy. Um, one, of our, um, one of the things that we try to do is make all these things possible. Obviously, there can be confusion and there's 10 ways to do the same thing. But the idea is that since we can't predict all the different ways somebody wants to use it, we want to make sure that we've at least thought through them and provided ways to do it. So the, 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 the two most likely ways for you to want to solve that, well, three. One is 
um, give it its data source at runtime. Another is use a data provider to point it to the exact one you want. And the other is to properly name your data sources. And just in every data consumer, there's one line that says, you know, what, what data source names do you want this thing to bind to? And it can have multiple. We made sure it can support multiple because you may want to point it to one particular theming data source and one particular data data source. And so it's, you need two. And my, my basic philosophy is if you ever need two of something, you might as well make it up and make it possible to have, handle more, because somebody's going to come up with a reason why you need more. Um, so I hope that does that answer your question? All right. Any other questions? I think, oh, no, I'm out of time. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to be hanging out and at lunch if anybody wants to ask any more questions. Thank you.